Welcome, 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 everybody. Thank you so much for, for coming and joining us today. Uh, this webinar will be recorded for your viewing pleasure. Uh, in the meantime, um, we, are, we are going to get started. Uh, let me just get a few things going on here. Mm -hmm. All right. So, welcome to Nine Fatal Errors Market Sale. Nine Fatal Sales Errors Market Leaders Don't Make. I very much appreciate you all being here today. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, today we're going to be covering my most popular talk. Uh, it is the one that um, I have been asked to speak for for groups such as HubSpot's Inbound, uh, for Zoom, um, for a lot of different uh, various presentations all the way through. I will have the chat open um, throughout the, the presentation. Presentation. I cannot promise that I'll be able to, to take a look at it at all times, um, but I do want to, um, to be able to, to see everything as they're going on here. So let's get started. I'm going to start off with a true story today, you guys. Um, so KO Advantage Group, we're, we're a fairly young company. And shortly after we had incorporated, we were approached by a couple of gentlemen. They were two people partners that had just started their own uh, engineering consulting firm. These two gentlemen had actually worked previously uh, for a large oil and gas company as engineers. And as they would watch these large transactions come through with all these third-party vendors, they started to think to themselves, they're like, why are these guys closing you know hundreds of thousands millions of dollars in sales and here we are only making our salary we're they're no smarter than us we're way smarter than they are we should definitely be able to create our own business so as the economy had ebbed and flowed their company had given them the opportunity to take a buyout and so these two gentlemen threw up their hands immediately and they said yes yes buy us out like we want to start our own company so they were graciously given a large severance package and to start their own organization. And about six months after they had incorporated, they had some great meetings. They were have, connecting with a ton of people on LinkedIn. They had created such large networks over their period of time of working for these other companies. And they thought to themselves, they're like, this is fantastic. I can't wait until we start to close our business. Yet they still hadn't. They still hadn't had any single client go ahead and sign a contract with them. They hadn't closed a single dollar, which is when they came to me and they said, Kim, we need your help. We need you to go in there. We have these great meetings happening. We have these great conversations. We need people to go ahead and buy from us. And so I started to ask him a lot of questions. I asked him, you know, who have you been meeting with? What types of conversations have you been having? Like, you know, what's up, what are some of the information you gathered from the client? And throughout this entire process, it became very clear that they thought they were at the closing stage with their client, but they definitely weren't. They were actually really far behind. And so what I had let them know, I said, I said, listen, gentlemen, I said, this is actually where you're at. Number one, you really don't need more conversations with people. You just need those quality conversations. You definitely need to be asking a lot more information. You need to find out who's going to be part of this decision-making process. How can we ultimately use this to leverage and create this all the way through? And they, I let them know, I said, this is probably going to be something that we're going to sit down with. We're going to work on for the next 10, 12 weeks, and we'll get you there. And they said, Kim, absolutely. Absolutely not. We have no time to do this. We need the business now. And so I said, okay, fair enough. And so I'm going to tell you a lot of the information that I had told them. I'm also going to tell you how it ended up with them, where they ended up ultimately in the conversation. 
So before we get started with this, I want to kind of introduce you really briefly to KO Advantage Group. We are one of the fastest growing entrepreneurial schools. We are based here in Canada and we have students right across Canada and the US. Why do American students come to us? Well, because we are connected. We are connectors. We are relationship built people. So when we do focus on, we don't just focus on sales training for everyone. We focus on a very specific type of sales. We focus on high value B2B service based. So if you're in an organization where you are trying to sell the intangible, how do you sell the invisible to your clients? That's what we focus on. We're also really good curators of content. So not only do we take the information as much as we have it, but we take the information, we practice it, and then we go ahead and we deliver it all the way through. We do, we teach, we motivate, and that's how we do this really well. I started the company. I didn't actually just start the company just for the sake of. I actually started it because I had such a great background in sales. I graduated in 2006 from University of Alberta with a degree in finance, thinking I was going to sit in front of spreadsheets all day long and understand how to actually deliver better quantifiables to department heads to determine which sides were going to be open and closed. And as I was looking for my first career, a recruiter came up to me and she says, Oh, Oh, darling, with a personality like that, you are not meant to be sitting in front of spreadsheets all day. You are meant to be in front of sales. You are meant to go ahead and be in front of clients. You are a salesperson. And I cringed the moment she said that to me because I thought, oh, I'm like, this woman doesn't even know who I am. Like, why would she insult me and call me this icky thing? I'm not a salesperson. Salespeople are icky, right? And that was actually my first realization because she says, no, she's like, you are not an icky person. She's like, go read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, find out everything you can, come back to me, tell me if you would be interested in a sales career. And the one thing that Robert Kiyosaki said in his book that really stuck out for me was that he had started becoming a millionaire because he learned sales, because he had worked for Xerox. And the one thing I know better than anything else is that if a millionaire tells you to do something, if the smartest person in the room tells you to do something, you don't ask any questions. You just do what they say you're going to do. And uh, uh, Sheryl Sandberg said this really good in Lean In. She goes, if somebody offers you a ride on a rocket ship, don't sit there and question and ask what seat, just get on that rocket. So immediately I said, okay, you know, yes, if I try and I fail, I'm still going to learn something. So I'm going to learn this. And very quickly Xerox had broken sales into a process. And now I was completely enamored because learning sales as a process completely demystified the whole intention of what I thought it was. I thought sales was really this this um, charisma, almost like you had it or you didn't. You were born with it or you didn't have it. And by understanding sales as a process, do this, then this, and then get there, all of a sudden it made sense. Very quickly, I completely embraced the Xerox sales process. I became sales rep of the year in my first year there, outperforming 131 other sales reps across the country. I did it again in 2009. I took that same experience. I became the number one sophomore of the year at American Express for um, the global corporate payments. So now we weren't just dealing with $40,000 copiers. We're now dealing with $40 million transactions, but the process stayed the same. And it didn't matter if we were talking to entrepreneurs, small business physicians, national conglomerates, sales process was process. So after, despite all of that, I had a moment where I asked myself, what more do I want in my life? And in 2014, five years ago, I actually decided to quit my life and go on a little soul searching journey. And I traveled the world over the course of 15, 17 countries, actually, sorry, 17 countries over six months, seeing everything I possibly could see. And when I came back, I decided to really embrace the sales process. I decided to then go ahead and start teaching exactly what I was doing so well with Xerox and American Express and all those companies to everybody here, like you people, the, the people that are all online, our students all the way through. I am now Startup Canada's Female Entrepreneur of the Year. I am one of LinkedIn's most influential sales leaders to follow, Success Magazine's most inspirational blogger. I am a three-time author. My latest book, Sell More Faster, is there. And I'm considered one of the best salespeople to follow by various industries. 
So let's get into you guys. Let's stop talking about me and let's talk about you. So the first thing that those two gentlemen were doing really poorly was they were spending a ton of money trying to get as many leads as they could. I, I think from a high end, they really understood sales funnel, right? You get to, as much information as comes in, ultimately comes out. We need a lot of leads but only to a certain degree. You don't need to continuously get leads after leads after leads because here's the reality is that if, if we've been in business for six months, a year, two years, five years, 10 years beyond, we're probably sitting on top of a massive stack of business cards. And we might have met those people at a networking function or some other type of business function. We called them once, we gave them our pitch, and then that kind of ended the relationship. That is actually not the case. We don't need a large quantity of leads. We need quality leads. We want to be talking to the right people, not the most amount of people. And I see this all the time. I do a lot of free speaking at various meetup groups, not because I believe that I'm going to get a lot of leads there, but because I want to help educate as many small business owners as possible and let them know that if you are going after small, medium-sized businesses, large businesses, enterprises, if your ideal client is a company that is running $5 million, $10 million, $250 million organization, likely they are not hanging out at a free meetup. We do not need to meet more people. We need to meet the right quality of people. We need to be much more targeted. Eye on the prize, intentional focus. Find out who those people are. Start with that stack of business cards and go through them really quickly. If they look like they're selling somebody that could be your ideal client, start connecting with them again. Start creating that quality relationship because I see too many people spending time on blogging or running ads or dialing for dollars, essentially. I knew one gentleman who would spend 50 minutes every single day just calling. He was making calls after calls after calls. Yes, an hour at a time doesn't seem like a long time, but when in that same 50 minutes that you're spending every single day doing those phone calls and you're trying to get through 20 phone calls, you're not actually going after quality. I would much rather you spend that same amount of time talking to three or four people, not 20 people, because it's a waste of time. And when you do create conversations with people online, the idea is you want to get that offline conversation as quickly as possible. Not, not necessarily that you want to connect with somebody on LinkedIn and say, hey, my name is Kim. Are you interested in learning more about sales training and how sales training can help you in the future? That's not necessarily the case. You know, can we connect online? It's how can you create an, a decent enough relationship so that when you ask for somebody to connect with you offline, that it's much more valuable. If you, if your website, your contact us page does not ask for somebody's phone number, that is the absolute minimum thing that you have to do. When we host our own events, we always require a phone number because we want to connect with people. We want to be voice to voice or face to face with them as quickly as possible. So when you start to create a, even a slightly quality conversation, you find out that this person could be the ideal fit for your client. We want to create that offline conversation. So get the phone number number get the meeting. You cannot move your high quality sales conversations very quickly if you are not getting the phone number as quickly as possible. And for those of you who have joined, I ha do have the chat open. Feel free if you have any questions as we go through there. I have saved time at the very end for questions as well um, because I love to engage with you guys all the way through. So fatal error number two, value is inherently earned. These gentlemen that I had told the story at the very beginning, they had worked for some very, uh, very prevalent, very large oil and gas companies. And so they would say, this is the experience that we had. We should work to each other. And ultimately it wasn't that they had that experience that they could actually move these sales cycles forward. They had to create that value all the way through them. When I worked for American Express, right? I mean, well, everybody has heard of American Express as a company. When I worked for American Express and I would call people and let them know that, at no given time would people say to me, they're like, oh, you worked for American Express. That's amazing. We would love to give you hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to transact with you. No, if anything, I actually had to work harder for that business. I had to work as hard as possible because people says, well, if you're with American Express, why should I be doing business with you? So the idea behind slowing down the process is to know the value of your solution and ensure that you're, you're understanding and working with your client. People want to work with you because of what you're going to do for them. How are you going to help them through this entire process, not they, they don't want to work with you because you have a really fancy name. 
So I want to start stop at this point in time, and I want to ask this question. It's one of the questions that we ask in our program, KO Sales Zoom, is would your client be willing to pay for the experience created in your sales call? I'm, oh, I, the chat is open right now, and I want to hear from you guys. Type a yes, type a no. I want to hear from you. If, if I asked any one of your clients that were working with you in the sales meeting, so they have not bought from you at this point in time, they are still in the sales process, would they be willing to pay for the experience that you create in your sales call? And I'd love to see some answers. Yeah. So Jillian says, yes, they would. I, yeah. Um, I want to hear a few more people. You can answer me privately. You can answer me all together. I'm, I'm open for everyone. But I mean, here's the thing, you guys. It, if you don't believe that they would, Kev says, yes, they would. This is fantastic. I'm so glad that you're creating all of this value all the way through. Sean Larkin's like, he's like, nope. He's like, they would never pay for the value I, I would create in the first call. Um, yes, Tracy says yes. And Tracy is a graduate of KO Sales U. So I'm so glad you're saying yes, Tracy, because if not, we would have to put you through the program again. Um, you know, this trying to find that balance, right? <laughs> yeah. Tracy's laughing. She's like, oh my goodness. I would, she's like, I would love to go through the program again. But uh, I would hate to be forced to go through it because I didn't learn the first time. So I'm so glad that you're saying yes. Here, here's the thing, you guys. If someone is honoring you, so if, if, let's assume that we have now asked our client for a very first meeting, whether it is for a 20 minute interaction, Dave Robbins says that maybe, maybe some of our events, but not, when, you know, maybe when we go to the field sites, but we're not really sure. If somebody is honoring you for 20 minutes of their time, now, now this is a meeting, okay? I want to make this very clear. This is not asking for the meeting, which comes before this, right? We cause somebody to ask them for that face-to-face -face interaction, but now they have given us either a face-to-face -face or a voice-to-voice, -voice, right? We have booked them for 20 minutes on a phone call. We have booked them for 20 minutes on a Zoom call. We are in their office for 45 minutes to an hour. If they have graced you within 20 minutes, an hour of their time, Ultimately, they have said, what I could have been doing with that time, right? I find this meeting that I'm with Dave, with Tracy, with Sean, with Kev, with Jillian, I find that to be more valuable than had I chosen not to do something else. Because the opportunity cost, if they had that same 20 minutes or that hour of their time, what could they have been doing? They could have been building their own business. They could have been making their own phone calls. They could have been delivering some type of service or addressing customer issues. But they had, or even if they're a small business owner, they could have been spending time with their families. Like, let's be very clear here. If they're spending time with their families, um, you know, and they have ultimately said, no, the time I'm going to spend with Dave is more important than any other time that I, I'm going to see. They have been paying for that experience. Right? And it is your job to ensure that that payment that they've given, that time, the one resource that none of us have more of is valuable. So they have already paid for this all the way through. It is our job to ensure that it is worthwhile for their time. Which brings us to fatal error number three, that all meetings are good meetings. Let's be very clear here. I mean, sometimes we get so excited to finally get the meeting. We call the client. We have agreed. They have agreed to meet with us. We're like, yes, yes, I finally get this meeting. I, this is so fantastic. And we get to that meeting and we have, um, and Sean is asking for example of value. Yes, Sean, we will address this at one of the later fatal errors. And if I haven't fully addressed it, remind me at the very end and we'll address how do we create value. We get so excited to get the value that's meeting all the way through that we, we show up to the meeting almost thinking that like, this is fantastic. I'm going to show up and I am just going to either pitch to my client. I have created this great presentation that I'm going to deliver to them. I'm going to give them this demo. I am just going to find out more about them. And we're going to ask a whole bunch of questions. Now, let's be clear, you guys. Assume that we're aligning this to this, the exact same way that we would play in a sporting event, right? We're Sidney Crosby on the ice, right? You know, one of the top people. Would Sidney Crosby go to one of the, the best games or even just any game, right? You know, the, if the games are what he's being measured on, would he show up to a game and not even practice? Would he say, it's okay, coach. I've done this before. I know exactly what I'm doing. Absolutely not. It doesn't even matter that Sidney Crosby is like one of the best hockey players available right now. No coach would put him on the ice if he doesn't feel like he would need time to prepare for what he was going to do on that time. So if you're going to go ahead and think that you're somehow better than Sidney Crosby, that you're just going to show up without taking the time to practice or even know what you want to get out of the meeting, 
How do you know you're going to get it? Because not every meeting is going to have the same intention. And if your intention in that meeting is, well, I'm just going to find out more about the client. Okay, well, fine. What can you find out? What do you need to find out about the client that number one, you can't find out from their social media or their web presence? What else do you need to find out? And what information do you need to gather from the client to even know if they're the right client for you? What kind of information do you need to find out to know that this is going to be a good fit for you? Or are you planning on going there and just giving them a whole bunch of information and hoping something would stick? And this is where a lot of people get this wrong. You would never go on a first date and talk entirely about yourself on how great you are and how many people you've dated in the past and how your ex-wives and ex-girlfriends and ex-husbands and everything have all said wonderful things about you. And you're like, this is fantastic. And you would walk away from that first date thinking, that was such a great first date. I spent all my time talking about myself. The other person on the other end would be like, this is ridiculous. Like, why would I want to go on another date with them? Know what the purpose is of your meeting. And at minimum, spend five minutes in the car before going in there and ask, what do I need to find out about this client? What do I need to find out in order to move this conversation forward? In order to know that they're the right client for me? In order to know that they're going to be a good candidate for later on purchasing my services or products? Because the thing that we need to recognize is that as wonderful as it is that our buyer is going to be on their own journey, right? They're ultimately not. They, they ultimately know, have to know where they are because as wonderful as it is to take all the information, no buyer, when you are in buyer position and we've all been there, we've all had to be in a situation where we've had to buy someone's services. Nobody sits there and thinks, wow, that person gave me so much information. I'm ready to buy. They take their time and they contemplate this. They have to understand, well, does this person meet my goals? Are they going to help me get there faster, better, more efficiently all the way through this? Right? We have to understand that. And Jillian put a great comment in the chat. She's like, I need to spend time like booking in my calendar to practice. Absolutely, Jillian. You're absolutely right. Because sales is a skill where we don't go ahead and like say one day we're going to learn how to play piano and just open up a, a workbook and start playing on the keys. We have to learn sales is a skill and it takes practice and practice to get better and better. People will say to me, Kim, you are a sales ninja. And I say, well, yeah, but that's because I spent all of my time practicing and practicing. You don't just show up at a dojo one day and be like, I should be a black belt, right? You start at white belt. You start at like, you know, the worst place possible right? where it's really, really hard and you work your way up and you do that every single day. But remember, because your buyer is on their own journey, you are helping them along in the journey, not forcing them to get to the very end. You are a tour guide. You are showing them the very best of you and helping answer their questions, not trying to pull a cat on a leash, right? If you've ever tried to pull a cat on a leash, the cat just like sits there, lays down and dies. It's like, I do not want any part of this. You are not there to pull it along. You are there to be with them all the way through. So how do we create more value all the way through was one of Sean's question. How do we create more value? Well, number one is that we have to spend more time listening than talking. Most people think sales is the process of talking rather than listening. What do I say? What do I say in the sales process? And this is terrible because we do not want to go through the sales process really fast. We actually have to be patient with it. We have to understand our clients and we have to have our clients know that we understand them. This becomes this very meta thing. Like we cannot move forward in the sales process unless this, the client knows that we know about them and we can communicate that we know about them, right? Nobody wants to feel like they're being sold to. So we have to ask them a lot of questions. Questions show understanding. Questions show genuine curiosity and concern because if we're asking them questions and getting information from our clients, then we can create a custom solution with them as opposed to, hey, this is what we have to offer. Is this something that you find interesting? It's no, how do you currently do this? How would you like to see this done? How would you like to create this? And if you don't believe me through this process, I mean, at the end of the day, right, one of the, one of the great philosophers says you have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as often as we're speaking. If you're sitting in your client meeting and you are spending the first hour, right, more than 45 minutes talking to your client, 
you have done that meeting completely wrong. Your client should spend the first 45 minutes talking to you and you should spend the first, the last 15 minutes talking about yourself or how you've been able to create this. The first 45 minutes should be devoted to asking high quality questions of your client all the way through. Because when you're asking powerful questions, you will get more powerful answers. There's an old saying says, if you don't like the answer, ask a better question. We need to ask better open-ended questions. Who, what, where, when, how, or why? If your questions are not being started with those types of words, then you're not asking high quality questions. Oftentimes we get defaulted into asking closed ended questions. Closed ended questions force the clients to give a yes or no answer, or even just a one word such as what is your budget? What is your budget is posed as an open ended question, but it's actually a closed ended question because it only forces one word. Well, $50,000, $5,000, or really what the answer is that your client's going to give you is zero. My budget is zero. I have no money to spend on this product or service right now. Whereas open-ended questions, who, what, where, when, how, or why, give us information. They allow the inclusiveness of the conversation. And then we can start to pull the discovery string. I was sitting in a meeting with a, uh, with a client in the last week. And we were talking about some of the questions that were being asked. And they said, well, we typically ask things like, you know, have you, have you done this type of event in the past, right? Do you know who's going to be part of this decision-making process, right? Are you that person? Um, you know, uh, what are, sorry, um, could you describe to me, you know, why you would see this a value, right? Even could you describe to me is like a yes or no question. The person is typically going to give you some information, but even just asking, could you is like really forces just the yes or no. Where do you go with a conversation if all you're asking your clients are yes or no answers? Well, yes, we do that. Yes, I see that a value. Yes, we've worked at that in the past. Okay, so what? Whereas when we change that all the way through, not are you the decision maker, but who else is going to be a part of this decision? Who else will have a say in how this is going to ultimately be perceived inside your company, right? How will you determine a successful project, right? How will you be measuring the success? What metrics should we be measuring all the way through this? Why is that important? Now we're creating value because value doesn't necessarily mean that we're telling the client all this information. Value is actually created by having the client go ahead and say, hmm, I never thought of it that way. Hmm. I, that makes me, to, that gets me thinking. When we get our clients thinking or giving us information, that's where value is created. Think about one of the best dinner parties that you've ever been to, where you think, oh my goodness, the host was so wonderful. And typically it's because the host was asking you a lot of questions. Dale Carnegie wrote all about this and how to win friends and influence people. If you want people to feel special, ask them a lot of questions. And when they feel special, they feel valued. And if they feel valued, you've been the provider of that value all the way through. Because the thing to understand is that the person that asks the questions owns that conversation. Make this very clear. If we allow our clients to ask us all the questions, ultimately they've taken ownership of the conversation and we have given them that inner ownership and that's okay to a certain point. But if you've given all the ownership, all the power of the conversation to your client, ultimately you have also said, if I am going to give you the power so that you can ask me the questions and hopefully one of the answers I give you is the right answer that you need to hear in order to move this sales cycle forward. It's almost like you have said to them, I, I want to be in control of the sales cycle, but I'm not actually going to take control. I'm going to drive this car from the passenger seat. I'm going to let you take the driver's seat at this point and hopefully we'll get to the same destination. No, if you want to be in the driver's seat of your own sales cycles, if you want to own, if you want to take the power of how your sales cycles are going to be going, if you want to take the power in knowing where you're going to take your client, when you're going to close those sales, how much that sale is going to close, when it's going to close, you need to be in the driver's seat, which means that you have to be the person in control of the questions. Questions show understanding questions take power. Spend your time writing out the questions that you need to ask before going to every meeting because that's how you're going to number one, create value. Number two, ultimately move the sales cycle through. 
So fatal error number five is ultimately assuming. As we go through this, we're going to start to assume. Chances are you might have been through a sales cycle like this before. Chances are you've seen the, the issues, the problems, the challenges that this client has faced. And we go in and we assume, right? We, we've seen this before. This is what you need. This is your problem. You might be a website designer. You say, you know what? Your problem is that you don't have any enough leads. We're going to work on your SEO and then that's going to help you get to better leads all the way through. Listen, your problem is, is you don't have enough clients or you can't find the information quick enough. We're going to work with you. We're going to do some internal processes. We're going to give you some better processes and then you're going to be able to get through that all the way through. But the problem is, is that when we go in and we assume, right, this is what I've seen before because I've seen it hundreds and tens and different times before, we go in with a diagnosis. You become the doctor that has the seven minute appointments, right? This is a reality. Doctors have seven minute appointments because they read all of the symptoms on a chart. They say, boom, 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 boom. Yes, this is your prescription there and you go on your way. Clients don't want to feel like they're just one in a hundred. They want to feel like how they believe they are. I am unique. I am different. I am special. This, I need something that is going to be individualized for me. And by not just trying to go to solution right away, but rather letting the client be a part of that journey, part of that discovery process, part of understanding with them. Now they truly understand that you are the right person to provide them the solution because this might be the same process that you've gone through hundreds and tens and thousands of times before, but this is brand new for this client. This is the first time they've had this issue. This is the first time they have engaged you in part of this process. So we, number one, we don't want to think we know the answers. We want to know that we know the answers. We want to ask the questions that we believe we've seen a hundred times before and find out from your client's perspective, what they believe. Because when we tell the client something, it's up to her skepticism. Right? They're like, you know, Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, this is what I think you need, or this is what I, you know, this is definitely what you need because I, I've seen this before, right? They're okay. Well, sounds great. The client's thinking to themselves, they're like, I get it. You've seen this before, but I'm unique. I'm different. I'm someone special, right? And I don't want to be told because anything you tell me is up for skepticism. Whereas when we ask the client the information and they tell us the answer, now it's their truth. When the client tells us, now we, now they know that we know, and that takes it to a whole bigger level, which brings us to number six, answering those objections. As we start to move forward in the sales process, we're going to start to have the client bring us up objections. They're going to say, well, what would be like if this happened? Or how will you do this in our situation? Or what does it come in green will sometimes be an objection. Oftentimes those objections aren't because that is the sticking point on whether they are moving forward or not, but rather the objection is usually a point in time when the client starts to really question and say, will you address my unique needs? Will you understand me as an individual? And we want to make sure that we are clarifying the objection before getting to it. The client ultimately wants to know, will you take care of me? if something different happens or something happens all the way through. So the first thing is that we have to clarify the objection, right? Well, why is that important? Or what does that mean to you, right? Why is this a concern for you, right? How, how would you like us to address this if that, is, that situation does come up? Get the information and ask the question and have the client help work with you on the answer. Don't assume that you're just going to answer it. Yes, there's going to be some objections that can answer be answered very quickly, but other times ask yourself, what is the client really asking me? See if you can address it first with a question and then provide an answer all the way through by creating this as a collaborative process. The client understands that you get me all the way through, which brings us to fail error. Number seven proposals as contracts or scopes of work or lengthy letters of intention or whatever else you think you can call it. We never want to send a proposal and call it something different. A proposal in the sales process is a proposal. A proposal is a sales document. It is nothing else. A brochure, brochure is a brochure. A scope of work is a scope of work. A contract is a contract. None of those 
are also known as a proposal. You wouldn't say, I'm going to send you the contract slash proposal. I'm going to send you the proposal and the contract. A proposal is a proposal. So the proposal ultimately is a summary of the journey that we have gone on together. We never go ahead and propose to our future significant other and say, listen, honey, I'm going to, I'm going to propose to you slash give you the marriage certificate. They're two separate things. They're two separate moments in time. You would never try to combine them all together. So we want to make sure the proposal summarizes the journey that we are on. And when we're in romantic relationships, the proposal is a separate moment. It is ultimately saying, listen, honey, love of my life, this is the journey that we've gone on. Look on how far we've come. Look at all the goals that we have decided that we want to work on together. These are all the places and things that we will do better together. Will you marry me? That's what the proposal is. When we're in our program, we only focus on a six slide proposal. A six slide proposal because it easily summarizes all the information. The first slide is really the goals. Where do you want to be? Product or service aside, where does your client want to be in a year, three years, five years, even if you never entered the picture? Okay. Where does that have to be? And then in the second and third slide is, is where the, they currently are and the consequences of them staying and not changing action. And oftentimes when we ask the clients, where will they be if nothing changes? How will this impact their business? They will start to get into some deep, dark places all of a sudden. Trust me, people in most companies, most people are usually only one pay, paycheck away from being completely destitute and bankrupt. They will go to these deep and dark places very, very quickly. And that's okay. We need them to articulate how bad they think it could be. Not because we want to fear monger, but because we want to know what their reality is. And then we want to take them to the ideal state. Where will they be when we're working together? When we are finished working together, not when we're working in the midst of it, but when they are completely finished. When we're completely finished on working together, where will they be? And then we talk about the timeline. Where will they be after we are finished? And then ultimately through sales magic, this means that they have to make a decision at this point in time or within two weeks from today in order to get where they need to be. And then we get into the investment and that return on investment. Because the ultimate proposal should really clarify the difference between the destination versus the transportation. And too many people's presentations and proposals will focus on how to get there. They will focus on the transportation. But the most successful proposals to a client will focus on the destination. So think of it this way. When an airline goes ahead and tries to sell you a dream vacation, they focus on two places. They focus on number one, where you are currently and how crappy it is for you to stay one more day where you are. So they never focus you on how beautiful it is in your location in the summertime, because in most places, the summertime is beautiful, unless you're in one of those places where the summertime is like disgustingly gross. And that is typically when you go on vacation. But in Canada here, they always focus us on Canada in the middle of winter because it sucks. And if they're not trying to sell us in the middle of winter, they're focused on how close we are to winter. They're like, oh, it's September. Winter's only six weeks away. You're going to feel frost and cold. This is when you need to be out here because the consequences of staying where we are when snow starts to hit is miserable. And then in the second scene, they love to focus us on the dream vacation on the beach. Oh, and usually it's like Cancun or Costa Rica or some other beautiful Caribbean location. And they focus us on the beach and the white sands and the ocean breeze. And you get this feeling of euphoria. You're like, oh my goodness, that would be so much bliss. And at no time do they actually focus on how they get there? Because when I ask people, let's just stop here for a second, right? For those of you that have heard this one before, don't answer the question. But for those of you that have never heard me do this example before, what is the airline ultimately selling you in that commercial? If they're focusing number one on where you are and how much it currently sucks, and number two, where you wanna be, which is that beach vacation, what are they trying to sell you? What is, what is that sale happening? 
And I want to hear a little bit in the chat. I know people are going to start to open the chat and you're going to start to, to put this all in here. So I'm going to give you guys a second because, yeah, so we have Dave Robinson. The promise of better, right, is what Dave says in here, right? Who else has an example? I think a few of you have heard me do this one. Um, experience, I always get people tell me, they sell you experience, right? They sell you, they sell you promise, right? Um, the sell, they're selling you the feeling of warm sun and sand on your face, right? You know, I love it. Happiness. Kev says happiness. They're trying to sell you happiness, right? Some people will say emotion. Sometimes I'll get that one, right? They're trying to sell you all this other stuff. Okay. Here's the reality, you guys. They're selling you none of that because what an airline actually sells you, what they literally sell you is a seat on a plane. And yet somehow they never talk about that seat on a plane. And why don't they talk about it? Because what they sell you sucks. What they sell you is showing up to an airport two and a half hours early. They sell you, they, they would try to have to sell you cramming your overhead luggage into a compartment bin that's way too tight. They would sell you the process of having to sit in a really cramped seat for the, the next six hours, going 30,000 feet in the air and having to buy overpriced drinks from the woman that's walking through with the beer cart. I mean, ultimately they can't sell you all that. They're not selling you 30,000 feet in the air for the next six and a half hours. They focus you on what you get after they are completely finished because you never walk up to a ticket airline at an airline ticket counter and say, I'd like to buy one experience, please. And they'd be like, fantastic. You get to walk through TSA. Congratulations. There's your experience. That isn't what they sell us. They focus on us the sale after the sale when they're completely done, which is the beach. So the question you have to ask yourself in your proposal is what is your client getting after you are no longer working with them? Because the reality is as much as it's lovely to see your bright, smiley, shiny, happy face, as much as you believe your client really wants to work with you, they really don't. They don't want to be working with you. They want to be done working with you. They want to be finished working with you. And if you're in the process of you, you go ahead and thank you, Vinny. <laughs> Thank you. Your analogies are wonderful. Your, your client wants to be finished. And if you're in a process of like, maybe you're in a long-term agreement, let's say you're an IT service person, right? And you want to sign your client up for a three or five-year agreement or contract, right? They don't want to be talking about what it's like to be finished that five years, maybe, but they want to, whatever process you have to go in through assessments and everything else like this, be done with it and focus on what it's like to no longer have to worry about their IT services, to no longer have to worry about any of that other stuff. They're done, right? They're in the bliss stage all the way through. So fatal error number eight, logically it makes sense. The other thing that we'll typically get into the, 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 the fallacy of is we try to talk to our clients about why logically this decision makes sense. Because Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, you are going to save yourself so much money. You are going to save yourself so many hours. We are going to help you do all of this other stuff. Logically, it makes sense. You're going to bring in so many clients and do, 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 do all the way through. But here's the reality is that behind every logical business there is an illogical, irrational person making a decision. When I worked for Xerox, they would, every year, we'd have to do a brand new sales training, right? It was like sharpening the saw. They would bring us in, even though everyone knew how to sell, how to do sales. And even if you're one of those people who's like, I've worked in sales before, great. Let's help sharpen that saw. And we would come in, they sharpen the saw. And we, one year they brought us in a, uh, a sales trainer that was focused on creating these ironclad business situations. How do we create a business proposal that logically makes sense? And we would go through and we would talk about all the quantifiables and, and uh, uh, quantifiables and um, quali qualitative analysis on how we could do all this stuff. And we would talk to Mr. Customer, you could save yourself so many minutes doing this process. And if you times that minute by an average hourly wage, ultimately you're saving yourself $3,000 every quarter. Logically, this makes sense. And we would create these business situations and the client would say, mm -hmm, yeah, um, you know what? I'm still going to have to think about it. And we'd be like, what is there to think about? $3,000 a quarter you're saving. Like, what, what are you stupid or something? Like, like you're saving yourself all this money. I don't understand what there is to think about. And the client would still need to think about. But the reason why was because despite all that logic, they weren't emotionally motivated. There was nothing there making them excited to change. We started throwing a bunch of numbers at them 
and there was no reasons for them to go through that. One of the things that we'll talk about in, in KO Sales U is you could go ahead and maybe your product or service helps to save a client time, right? Which is a lot where people will go, right? Well, we save them time, right? Every single person, doesn't matter what your value proposition, almost every single person will tell you that your their value proposition is they help their clients save time and money through faster and more efficient processes. It's like, great, every other company. Um, but at the end of the day, right, what this really is, is not what your client will save in the time, but what they can do with that time. And then what will that time ultimately mean to them, right? Well, what would you do with that time saves, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Customer? Well, I suppose I would go after more customers. Awesome. And if you had more customers, what would that do for your business? Well, I suppose that could bring us in, you know, with some extra revenue. Great. And how would it feel to bring in that extra revenue? And by bringing in the conversation about how does that feel, right? Now we're inviting the emotion. This is where sales cycles move really fast really fast because when somebody feels good, right? Going back to the airline analogy, when they feel excited to be on that beach, when they feel the warmth of the, the sun on their skin, as Jillian put it, now they want to get on that plane. Because if we talk about logically why they should be on that plane, nobody's really going to get on the plane. When they know how they'll feel afterwards, oh, now it makes sense. Because the reality is the heart knows what the head needs. And we need to start inviting the emotional conversation through this, right? How do we emotionally tap into even the business to business, high value services conversation? And when we can tap in into number one, our own emotional intelligence, number two, help to use emotional intelligence from others, we can create better and longer and connected relationships. And if your ultimate goal as a business owner, as a salesperson, is to create clients that are gonna be clients of yours for life, get to that loving feeling as quickly as possible. I have a sticker on the back of my computer that I received from LinkedIn. They, they sent me a sticker and I have it on the back. And it's a quote from Airbnb and they say, create a service that 100 people will love not one that 1 million people will kind of like. And I'm like, oh, I love that. Because when you can connect to that, how do we create something more? How do we create that experience? How do we create that I have to have that? Now we can create faster moving conversations. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we're selling or what we're buying. People will always buy on emotion and then justify with logic. If we try to get them to buy on logic and or buy on logic and then try to justify with emotion, we've completely taken out that piece of the equation. If we talk to them entirely logic based, we don't know the reasons why someone wants to go through this. Simon Sinek talked all about that. Start with the why. Why, right? What does the heart feel and how do we connect with that? And then finally, that it's done once the contract is signed. I love this photo. What you don't see in this picture is those two people have um, a, a contract signed from their client and they're trying to run as fast as possible out of, uh, yes, Jillian, thank you. This is a big part of storytelling. Absolutely. Storytelling is one of the, the fundamentals and it is one of the modules that we even include inside our KO sales suit program. We're one of the few sales trainings that actually talk about storytelling. Uh, we definitely don't do it as to your level, uh, but we definitely include it because it's so important. So these people are running away. They just got a contract signed from their client. They're like, see ya, Mr. Customer. We got our contract. We never have to see you again, right? Let's be serious, you guys. We want to make sure that our clients are going to be clients for life. There's no point in having a client if you're not going to create an experience that they're going to want to stand on top of a mountain and sing your praises. Every single student of ours, every single graduate, we do everything possible to make sure that our students are going to stand on a mountaintop and sing our praises. And if if we're not there, we do everything we can because we want to make sure that we're helping clients not just learn sales process, but become better business owners, start to move their business, grow all the way through. Your clients will always be your best advocates if you nurture that relationship. And the research shows that 30% of your re new revenue should somehow be attributed to previous clients, whether that is through referral networks or previous clients buying even more. So you need to make sure that you have a great follow-up strategy. 
follow up with your previous clients. Continue to keep them in your tribe. Even if you are a one-time product or service, how do you continue to pre give them more value and more value all the way through? Follow up with them because you never know when the process is going to change. You never know when something has changed with them or when they have it. Um, is follow-up part of your sales cycle? Absolutely, Jillian. Follow-up is a big part of the process. Follow up is like such a, a huge and integral part. And number one, I can't tell you of number one, we, we typically in, in our personal sales cycle, um, I would say probably about 80% of our sales will happen within the first 60 days of someone connecting with us and then ultimately deciding to move with us, which means that there's about that 20% which is this long tail. 20% um, of people that have, um, have gone ahead and never, or have connected with us and the timing wasn't right because timing is everything. So we wanna make sure that we connect with people. You wanna connect with people, uh, I like to say every, every 90 days at least, right? With the reasons and the seasons, right? For every season, there is a reason, you know, just to touch base, just to let them know, you know, what's new with you, find out a little bit more about them because timing is everything. And I have one entire, deals because I have contacted someone at the right time. They were in my sales cycle. The timing wasn't right. I connected with them 60 days, 90 days later. And they're like, Oh, you know what? You're so right. You know, now's the time I'm ready to buy. Now's the time I'm ready to move forward. Continue to do that. And then as well as with your, your, former clients or your, um, your current clients connect with them. One of the reasons why we host our monthly lunch and learns, yes, we want to bring people into the conversation, but we also do our best to bring in all of our former graduates. We invite them. They become students of ours for life, we say. And so all of our former graduates are allowed to attend every single lunch and learn for free for as long as like we are hosting them. And then we're also having a brand new annual event where all of our former graduates get to attend for literally the cost of us to put it on, right? So we said, okay, what, how much is it going to cost us to put it on per person? Okay. The, the only thing we want to receive is the cost back. Everyone else can pay a little bit more because there's going to be a lot of, we know there's a ton of value that's going to be provided in that, but we want to make sure that they're constantly being brought in. One of the other reasons why we decided to run these webinars is also for that reason too. We always think of our clients and our graduates first and say, what more do they want? And then how do we provide that experience? for all of our prospects. I hope that answers your question. Um, so what happened to those two engineers that I started off this story? I started off the story telling you about the two engineers. They ended up coming back to me, right? So, um, so they, when they had left, they said, Kim, 10 weeks was just way too much time. Like, there's no way we need our sales and we need our sales now. And, um, and so I said, okay, you know what? I'm sorry. Like, I can't do anything for you. Um, I am not some type of magician where I can say one word and make all of these quote unquote deals that are close to close, all this unclose. Like this is a process. And if you value the relationships you have with your client, you're going to value the time that we're going to spend on doing this the right way. So they left and they came back to me a hundred days later and they said, Kim, we need your help. We're now, we're, we're now closer than we've ever been before in closing this deal. We just need you to come in and just do your one magic thing and close this deal. And I asked them, I said, well, what else has happened? And they said, well, we've had more meetings with a client. Um, who's changed? And they said, well, all these people have changed and all this stuff. And what I realized was actually they weren't closer ahead. They were further behind. The conversations never really went anywhere and they were constantly trying to push for the scope of work. They were defining a scope of work for a client that hadn't even decided that they wanted to be in a relationship with them. And instead of trying to solve for a solution, they were hoping that they would throw a dart at a dartboard in intentions that it would stick. I never heard from these gentlemen again, and chances are I have an idea. I know we said that one of the things we never want to do is assume, but I have a feeling that the one thing that we will assume on probably happened with them. They probably ended up just going back and getting themselves a job because they couldn't make entrepreneurship work for them. And it wasn't because they weren't smart enough. It wasn't because they didn't care about their clients enough. It's because they didn't take the time to understand the process that they were in and how do they create that and how do they move it forward. Instead, they were trying to solve a problem for someone that didn't even recognize that they wanted to be a part of it all the way through. 
So we do talk about KO Sales U. I do want to let you guys know that no matter whether you decide on continuing on, if you are in the Edmonton or Calgary region, we do a monthly in-person lunch and learn. If you are connecting with us online, we're going to be doing these monthly webinars every single month. Um, I believe the next one will actually be in two weeks from today, just because of the way the timing works out. I wanted to introduce you to Cameron S. Um, Cameron S. is an engineer. He attended one of our monthly lunch and learns and after the lunch and learn only attending the lunch and learn. So the same content that we're delivering you today, he's let us, he let me know that he just made another call and had to let me know that he had moved a discussion from about a five to a nine out of 10 through what he had learned in one of our one hour sessions here, simply by making it more personal. He says it was like magic or something. Why do we do all this? Well, LinkedIn calls me their most influential sales leader to follow. And Mr. Zig Ziglar is my most influential sales leader to follow. He is also our number one value, which is this quote, you can have everything you want in life if you help enough people get what they want. Honestly, if nothing else, I hope you take this information. I hope you attend more of our monthly lunch and learns, more of our monthly webinars and help us help you become even more impactful, create even more value for your clients. Because when you create more value for your clients, you create more of everything. Thank you, Jillian. I love this quote too. This is actually our number one value for our company. We actually have three values. This is number one. Our second one is be the example. And number three is done is better than perfect. So I hope you take any one of those values and take it as you want. I would love to connect with you guys even more. Um, I am opening up my personal, uh, yeah, Jillian's already come to our Lunch and Learn. So if you're going to be coming to our Lunch and Learn this Wednesday, you'll see Jillian there. Um, in Edmonton, we'll be having it as a breakfast on Thursday. Um, if you want to connect with me personally, you guys, we are growing so fast. Honestly, I'm not going to be uh, um, opening up my personal meeting invite for much longer. I, I honestly believe that it's only going to be until the end of this month uh, because we're going to be bringing on even more people. We're moving up to a team of seven. And my calendar, if you're going to go to this link right now, kimorleski.com slash meetings slash Kim 18. I want to help you personally on how we can help you deliver even more value for your clients. Let's talk about your sales cycles. Um, because uh, at the end of the day, I, I will help as much as I can, but my calendar, you'll notice there's probably only like a few spots and available in any given week. Um, I typically fill out three weeks in advance. And we end every KO Sales U class with this question. Um, feel free to open up the chat at this point. You guys ask me any questions that maybe I didn't address, maybe that um, you want a little bit more clarification, go ahead, or just answer this question inside the chat. What will you do today that will have a significant impact on your business? It is Monday morning for most of you, right? Monday morning, Monday afternoon, if you're out on the East Coast, this is the time. What are you going to do today? Because we, the day is still young. Let's start creating action. Is it going to be connecting with some of those online conversations, moving them offline? Is it going to be better preparation of some of those calls? Is it going to be to, you know what, I'm just going to connect with Kim. Let's find out more about this. I want to, I want to be able to um, deliver a better proposal. I want to learn more about the six slide proposal, right? Whatever it is, but what are you going to do today? One of the other things that we'll typically see around our office is that education is not the same as application. We have spent the last hour going through a lot of education with you and I'm so grateful that out of everything, out of all of the options that you had to do for the last hour that you chose to spend it with us. So thank you so much for that. I feel honored for that. Now I wanna know how do we take that and turn this education into an application? The ocean was created one drop at a time. What are you doing today to help create a little drop, a little bit more and a little bit more? Done is better than perfect. Do something, do anything. Anything is better than nothing. It might be imperfect, but at least it's done, right? Be the example. Maybe you want to set up a brand new process for yourself all the way through. Thank you guys so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed this. Next month, we're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be doing prospecting. 
I believe. I'll have to double check with my team. But if you go to kimorleski.com slash webinar dash registration, just register. You're going to start to get our immediate notifications with every single webinar as we go through. Karen, I attend a networking event that you present in Toronto. Thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you. I'm so glad to do Thank you for attending this. I know you probably saw this before, Karen, so I'm grateful that you're, you're able to do this again. Dave Robinson, thank you very much. Jillian, thank you. I am so grateful to have all of you here today. I appreciate every one of you. Yes, Karen, powerful stuff. We have even more presentations. Um, if you guys are not in one of our local situations where you see our local web uh, lunch and learns, come on in, um, watch these webinars. We're gonna continue to give you even more information as we go forward. If you miss out on in the lunch and learns, you're gonna be able to follow us along on these webinars. This is your time for you. Go ahead, prepare all your questions. Go ahead and meet with me if you want to. Thank you, Andrew. I am very grateful um, for you to be here as well. Trevor, inspiring. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys. Um, we're off for today. I hope to see you all in a couple weeks when we do our next webinar. Stay tuned with all of our information on our website and everything. Darren, Chris, thank you guys. Um, I am incredibly blessed and grateful to have you all as a part of our tribe. And I look forward to seeing you all for our next one. Um, I am going to do one quick plug. We are doing an all day event on Tuesday, November 26th. I don't care where you are, get a flight, come in for this one day event. This is our, our newest annual event. It's going to be called The Connection. We're not just going to be talking about sales. We're going to be talking about how do you elevate the entire client conversation? How do you create even more value for your clients? How do you become Jerry Maguire's? fewer clients, more personal intention. We're bringing in some amazing guest speakers. Um, I am just finalizing them over the next couple of weeks. Announcements will be coming out Tuesday, November 26th for, uh, for the entire day for the connection. I look forward to seeing you either on our next webinar or at that event. Thank you guys all so much. It was an absolute pleasure. Goodbye to you. Oh, Sean Larkin. Yes, the 26th event is open to the public. Um, you can you can definitely um, go check it out. If you go to um, our events page is actually out of date a little bit. Um, but if you either go to Eventbrite um, and look at KO Advantage Group um, in the Calgary region or just even search for KO Advantage, you'll see that event available. Um, there are uh, two ticket prices, um, one for early bird and one for, for non-early bird. And then if you are a KO sales, you graduate, um, there is a special price there listed for you as well. Tally, thank you so much. I appreciate it as well. Yes, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you.